Good evening. I am Carolyn Rosprum, a member of the Eagle Historical Society. Welcome to this presentation sponsored jointly by the Alice Baker Library and the Eagle Historical Society, celebrating her story, The Women of Eagle. We'll take you on a trip down memory lane, beginning with historian and writer Alice Baker, for whom this library is named. She will share the beginning of Eagle's story, starting with the very first inhabitants. Next, Mrs. Wood will tell her story of the Eagle Diamond. We'll take a peek at the diary of an ordinary farm wife, Mary Churchill Coyer. Catherine Wedham will open the doors of her boarding house as she fills you in on the gossip of the turn of the century Eagle. Finally, we'll meet school teacher Liza Chapman Meredith, who taught area children for over 50 years. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Alice Baker. Somewhere among the fairy tales is the story of a magic ring. The possessor of this fabulous ring could put it on her table at night and thereby be able to go wherever she wished. I am assuming the possession of that ring and testing its powers by asking it to take me and you also through the history of Eagle beginning in the early 1800s. This region was a woodsy place woods more extensive than now, and timber much larger than that which now exists. Magic ring, take me to the animal trails which lead to the sources of water. These trails helped the Indians to the same source, and in some instances were the basis of highways yet to be built. It would have been a pleasure to meet the friendly Potawatomis, to see their villages. Proof of this fact is found in the Indian arrowheads picked up on my father's farm in the 1880s. Some of them are large, of heavy flint for deer and bear. The smaller ones must have been for birds and other small animals. There was a time when trappers had knowledge of this region. The many marshes and eagle made ideal homes for mink, Martin, a few beaver, and many muskrats. Hence, it was a rich region for men who knew how to trap. Many of the first settlers were prospectors. In 1836, three prospectors came upon a large prairie in the present town of Eagle. There, they saw a huge bald eagle hovering above the waving flowers and grasses. So impressive was this sight that they began referring to the area as Eagle Prairie. The first claim in present-day Eagle was made in 1836. It would have been interesting to be present that September day in 1836 when A.R. Hinckley cut his initials on a tree with such swiftness that Andrew Schofield is credited with saying, Thee is quick with thy knife, Ahira. Why did Hinckley decide with such haste on those particular acres? Water in a nearby spring. Their trail that morning had led to the big spring still flowing on Highway and Inn, just south of the railroad track. There was timber for a cabin, plenty of it, and clearing south and west provided fields for any crops without labor for clearing the land. In 1841, the township of Eagle was established. Several other settlers had purchased land in the southeast corner of Eagle Township where there was a sizable stream with running water. The settlers called their little community Eagleville. A second small settlement at the northeast corner of the township, two miles east of the present village, was known as Palestine. A third settlement was Jericho, located in the east central section of Eagle Township on the road to Madison and beyond. Settlers in and around Eagle were not indifferent to Christian worship, even if there was no edifice in which to carry on that devotion. They used their homes, their schoolhouses, and even held services in new barns. In 1842, Father Martin Kundig was designated the first missionary to the Catholics of Western Waukesha County. He traveled throughout the area on horseback, visiting Catholic families, and celebrating Mass in their homes or barns. This eventually led to the building of St. Teresa Church, a small frame building built in 1852. Apparently, it was important for the early German Catholics to educate their children in a Catholic school, 
and in 1852, a small one-room log school building was erected on land near the old cemetery west of the village. The blackboard was made of wide planks that were painted black, and the children sat on rough wooden benches. John Hagee, a lay preacher, came to Eagle in 1845. He purchased a farm later known as the Clody Farm. In the first few years of his arrival, he preached in schools at Eagleville, Palestine, and Jericho. Then he purchased the empty abandoned schoolhouse at the foot of Diamond Hill for $80 and generously gave the hamlet its use as a permanent church. This was to become the Eagle United Methodist Church. The actual location of the present Methodist Church dates back to 1870 when Thomas and Sarah Pittman deeded land on Main Street to the congregation. In those early days, the sanctuary looked very much as it does now. The discomfort of the straight back pews was eased by the women of the helping hand who fashioned cushions. Without them, only bone-tired listeners would ever fall asleep during a long dissertation. <laughs> The coming of the railroad to Eagle put an end to any hope for larger towns at Eagleville, Palestine, and Jericho. The railroad grew and made Eagle a thriving town. In its heyday, three men were employed to care for its traffic. There were 12 trains a day. Alas, our magic ring now returns us to the present day. Urbanization has made man yearn for the simple joys of rural living quiet and solitude, so continual and so deadening to the pioneer, now have curative values unknown to the farmer, but very real to the tent city dweller. Eagle is a purely residential town, and residents want to keep it that way. As my closing thought to you, I wish to urge you to keep records of the important things in your life. They are priceless and they give a picture of that former time that otherwise would have been lost. A good slogan for everybody is, put it in ink. is Mrs. Wood, Eagle, Wisconsin, from the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The stamp is September, October 13th, 1885. I don't want to even look at this. I know what it says in there. It's hard to believe that it's been nine years already. Let's see, it all started back in 1876. Charlie and me were living on a little farm near the Catholic Church on that hill over there. We were renting a piece of land from Mr. Devereaux. Did you know Mr. Devereaux? He was kind of a skinny little fellow. Well, he was slow to get anything done, and our well was giving out, and we were having a lot of problems. Charlie talked to him so many times, and finally he agreed to send some men. So. Mr. Wilford showed up with three men, and they started digging. And they were there, this was the third day already, and they still haven't gotten down to water. When I saw Mr. Wilford look down, and he picked something up, and he kind of brushed it up, brushed it off, and he walked over to me, and he said, here, I think you would like this. And I put it in my hand, and I looked at it, and it was a little pretty stone. It was about the size of a canary egg, it was kind of round on one side, and it was sort of the color of straw. Well, I had forgotten about that stone. I put it in a box with my good pin, actually this pin here, and I think it was about 1883 when my pin was broken, and I knew there was a jeweler in Milwaukee. So I took the early train into Milwaukee. That's 40 miles, and if you took that in a buggy, that's a long trip. Well, I knew the jewelry shop and the watch repair shop was someplace on Grand Avenue. So I walked until I found it, 
And I put my little pin on the counter and I asked the jeweler, I said, can you fix this? And he looked at it and he said, sure, I think I can. And that was the first time that I met Mr. Boynton. And while I was there, I thought I would ask him about my pretty little stone. So I showed it to him and he asked me and he said, what is it? That's funny for a jeweler to say, what is it? And I said, well, I don't know. A neighbor told me he thought it could be a topaz. And he looked at it and he said, well, you know, it could be. He held it in his hand for a long time and he said, where did you find this? And I said, oh, in Eagle. He asked me in the town. I said, no, it was in the village. He said, you know, I have a collection of gems. I would like to buy this. I said, well, how much would you give me for it? And he said, oh, I would give you a dollar. <laughs> and I thought, no, that was in September. And I thought, no, I'll keep my pretty little stone. Well, you know, 1883 was a bad year for me. Charlie was gone. By December, I was really short of money. I asked some places in, in uh, Waukesha if they would buy my pretty little stone and they weren't interested. So I went back to Milwaukee and I said, would you still like to buy my stone? And he said, how much did I tell you I would give you for it? I said, well, you told me a dollar. And just like that, he reached in a drawer, he got out a dollar, he handed it to me and he took my stone. I didn't know about any of this until later. But in January, Mr. Boynton hightailed it to Chicago. He went to see a friend of his that was a diamond expert. And his friend told him that this was a diamond of the highest water worth $700. Can you imagine that? The next thing you know, Mr. Boynton comes out to Eagle with some men and they start looking around and they're asking, you know, where did I live? But by this time, I didn't live there anymore. In fact, the place we lived at had even burned down. So Mr. Boynton and his friends took some soil samples and they took it to another friend who happened to be an expert and he told him that it was diamond bearing soil. Well, the next thing you know, this lawyer comes to Eagle. He buys Mr. Devereaux's land. First thing he does, he puts a big cloth fence around it. Now the people of Eagle were getting pretty nosy and they were wondering what was going on. So he told them that he was going to have a chicken ranch. In fact, he was even gonna have Plymouth Rock and Leghorn chickens. Well, I'll tell you, the villagers got a good laugh out of that because if he thought that black cloth was gonna keep the chickens in and the coyote and the fox out, he was badly mistaken. Then the truth came out that they were actually digging a mine and that my pretty little stone was actually a diamond. I was so mad, I didn't know what to do. So I went and I talked to a lawyer and he said, well, you know what you do? You go and offer him a dollar and make it a dollar and 10 cents and that would cover the interest and tell him you want your stone back. I did that, but of course, he refused. <laughs> Mr. Boynton had set up a mining company, and even the mayor of Milwaukee, Mr. Stolwell, invested in it. So, my lawyer filed a case with the Milwaukee Circuit Court. But what chance did I have, a farm woman from Eagle, against Mr. Boynton, who was a Civil War veteran, he was a politician, he was a friend of the mayor, and I actually heard that he was also a man about town. <laughs> so, we lost, and my lawyer filed a suit with the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Now, as soon as the word got out that Eagle became a mining town, people came from all over. And everyone was trying to buy land, and everyone was looking for diamonds. Some people were so crazy, they even wanted to change the name to Diamond City or to Diamondville. And problems were starting to happen with the mine. You know how it gets here in April. It started to rain, the mine was full of water. 
The newspapers were coming out, the Milwaukee Journal, the Milwaukee Sentinel, the Freeman, they were writing stories almost every single day, and of course, every time they did, more people came, and more people were looking and trying to find diamonds. In May, two more diamonds were found. Well, the excitement just continued. June, some more diamonds were, were found again, and people were just coming like crazy. I think it was in December of 1884 that Mr. Coons came all the way from New York City. He came on the train. He was a diamond expert, and he wanted to see the diamonds that were found in Eagle. And he looked at them, and he said, these are African diamonds. They're white. They're not like the original diamond that was found. They could not have come from here. Well, that did it. Everyone realized that there, somebody was doing something to add these diamonds. The mine closed down, everybody started to go away. Nobody was sued, nobody was accused of anything. All the miners left and that was the end. And now I have this letter and I know what it says. I lost the case in the Supreme Court in Madison. When I think about how much money that diamond cost, I could just cry. I am Mary, and this is my home on Main Street in Eagle. <clears throat> I have lived a very long time and I like to remember the old days when I was a farmer's wife out in the country. Here is a diary that I kept back in 1897 and 1898. It takes me back to a simpler time. It reminds me of hard work and simple pleasures. <clears throat> Saturday, February 20th, 1897. Snow and raining, cloudy but warm. Did not wash, did not feel able to. All got bad colds. I went over to Mrs. Tui's. Too bad, Mr. Tui died about four o'clock. Mrs. fainted for so many times. We did everything we could for her. Poor thing, just dreadful. Friday, March 12th. Funny weather. First it snows, then the sun shines. <laughs> Today. <laughs> then the wind blows. I don't feel good. My side feels so badly. Men are churning. Got my work out of the way. Men doing chores. Nothing else to do. George downtown half of the time. No letter from Ida yet. Ida is my daughter. Thursday, April 16th. Rained light showers all afternoon. Work as usual. Baked bread. Churned and made yeast cake with Maud's help. I cleaned the floor and got it ready and put the carpet down before dinner. George went down and got a bottle of enamel to blacken the stovepipe. We blackened it and put it up. <clears throat> Saturday, May 8th. Another fine day. Made pie, did up work as usual, then cooked greens. Henry picked their dandelions. Mr. McCold's brother was shot and killed by a tramp yesterday. He died. Too bad. <laughs> <clears throat> Saturday, June 19th, a beautiful day. Work as usual. Bought three quarts of strawberries. Did not have any to bake. Grandpa's gone to the old farm. Ida's feeling a little better, I hope. Henry's picking potato bugs and choring all afternoon. Then we got ready and went to the opening of Eagle Lake Hotel. Lots of people there. Got home at 7 o'clock. 
Wednesday, June 30th. Hot, hot this morning. Doc Fritz got married this morning, private. I got such a pain between my shoulders. Can't do much, only housework. Henry went after a black hog, nasty looking. I didn't do anything but sweat. Did not go after Ida either. Henry churned. Saturday, July 3rd. Terrible warm. Work all out of the way. Brought three boxes of strawberries and cooked beef. We all got ready and went to see the parade. After a while, we all went over to the grounds. We came home and got lunch. The folks got ready for Waukesha. Ida, Myrtle, Maud, myself, and Grandpa all went down to the fireworks. They were very good indeed. <clears throat> Saturday, July 25th. Beautiful day. Lots of work to do. Make bread and cake and churning. Ida, Flossie, my granddaughter, and myself are going to pitch right in. Grandpa went down and got beef. I cooked it down very tender. Ida swept the chambers. Flossie made the cake. I picked the string beans. Flossie got them ready. I dug potatoes and slicked up all around. Had dinner. Ida and Flossie washed the dishes. I could not do any more till I rested. Then I worked over my butter, washed off both stoops. I don't feel very well. Grandpa has an ascent in his pocket. Saturday, August 21st. Lovely morning. Ida is doing all the work. Flossie and Ruby came down a few minutes. Grandpa is doctoring the pigs. I am as weak as death this morning. I took our horse, old Rob, and drove up to the burying ground. On the way back, Grandpa brought me a bottle of beer for 15 cents. He had a glass for five cents. Sunday, December 5th. Beautiful day. Quite a slip of sleighing. Maud is still here. She expects to go home today. Grandpa hitched up old Rob. Flossie and myself took a short turn around the square. I came back, then he took the horse and flew down to Mother Norton for tobacco. <laughs> Monday, January 17, 1898. Lovely day, work as usual. I churned, made donuts, and one pie. Charles Lins came over. I gave him a pail of buttermilk and donuts. Grandpa gone to Palmyra and Little Prairie on his way home. Flossie's not feeling well. She has the back door trot. I sit here alone as usual. I steam my side with a hot flat, but the pain catches me still. Friday, March 11th. Little colder, work as usual. I made rye bread. Very good for my first time, Grandpa says. Flossie's at school. I have finished good night dresses and cut out two pillowcases, besides mending Grandpa's pants and drawers, <laughs> fixing stockings, and making Flossie's skirt last night. Flossie's gone to practice for entertainment. No letter from Ida tonight. Wednesday, April 6th. A beautiful day, still quite cold, and it freezes at night. Work as usual. No baking. I swept and cleaned up. Grandpa got a load of lumber for the pig pen. Henry is plowing. Maud went down to practice. Tuesday, April 12th. A beautiful day. My work as usual. Not feeling so bad as yesterday. Hope I will continue to. Grandpa is fixing the ice house and the hog pen. Henny, Henry finished dragging. Flossie is at school. I ripped up her brown waist and pressed out her skirt on the blue dress. I'm going to face it over to make it long enough. I feel so sad. 
Looks like rain. Thursday, April 28th. A beautiful day, work as usual. Papering, cleaning Flossie's bedroom. I'm doing the work around the house. Maud papered nearly all the room alone. I fixed the carpet, took it all apart, made it all over new. The state militia passed through en route for war. Poor fellows, little do we know how many will return. I am so sad not to know where Ida is. Three weeks today since she left home. Poor foolish thing. Good night. My name is Catherine. My mother, Agatha Breidenbach, emigrated from Ostdorf, Germany in 1852 at the age of five. Her family settled on the Breidenbach farm here in Eagle. My mother met Henry Schmidt and fell in love. When they married, they moved to western Wisconsin in Monroe County, which is where I was born in 1872. On a visit with the Breidenbach relatives back on the farm here in Eagle, I fell in love with Nathaniel Wedham. We married, and I moved back to Eagle in 1895. Nate found work managing the pickle factory for Mr. Van Holten. All summer long, the farmers and their families would gather their cucumbers to take to the pickle factory. My Nate, Joe Studi, and Pickle Jack Agathon dumped the cukes into a huge sorting machine. Then they were moved to huge vats standing 15 feet high and 20 feet around. They were filled with water, salt, brine, and dill. After a time, the pickles were taken out with giant scoops and stored in barrels. In the late fall, the barrels of pickles were loaded onto the train that went right past the building. From here, they were taken by railroad into Milwaukee and other cities. We bought a large home across from Pearden's garage. We were blessed with one son, Edmund, in 1905. We rented out rooms in our home, four bedrooms upstairs and two downstairs. Nate and I chose the one closest to the kitchen. I seemed to be busy in that kitchen all day, preparing meals for the boarders, as well as the tramps who hopped off the trains, knowing they'd get a free hot meal from me. Eagle was a bustling town then, and our boarding house was a good place for gentlemen and women to take up residence. I remember Dr. Smurl lived with us before eventually renting a room above Creston's grocery store. Jim Crawley was a respected and retired gentleman who joined us for a while. Miss Matzik, a school teacher, lived with us too. I recall she once made a valentine for me. I thought that was kind of her, but my granddaughter, Sally, who lived with us, was afraid of her. She claimed that Miss Matzik made faces at her behind my back. Silly girl. Dick Gibson was another boarder. He worked at the Green Mill in town. Fred Smith, who worked across the street at Pearden's Garage, lived with us for a while. We also had another school teacher from North Prairie, but she went home on the weekends. <laughs> Mr. Clody furnished us with extra beds for prisoners from the Milwaukee Jail who worked on farms in the area. One particular fellow was a talented artist. I gave him handkerchiefs to paint on. I recall one in particular. It was a beautiful eagle. Once my granddaughter, Sally, was stressing over an art contest assignment. He offered to do the work for her, but she shook her head no. I think she may have had second thoughts, though, when she didn't win. Perhaps she should have taken him up on that offer. When times were tight, I went to work for Dr. Fitzgerald. I visited shut-ins and some of his homebound patients. In those days, Mothers were confined to bed rest for 10 days after delivering their babies. 
I helped out doing whatever kind of home care they needed. The hospital was used from 1895 to 1953. Dr. Fitzgerald's office was on the main floor. Surgery and the recovery rooms were on the second floor. In 1912, Dr. Frederick Schmidt joined the practice. He was our little Sally's godfather. He practiced for 35 years until his death in 1946. My granddaughter Sally was such a help to me, but she was afraid to walk past the jail because the front door was often left wide open. One frequent guest of the jail was Twink Beelin, the owner of the blacksmith shop. When the police officer found him after a night on the town, he was escorted to his trailer down the road from St. Teresa's Church or to a waiting jail cell. I guess Sally took the long way rather than risk running into anyone who might be sleeping one off in the jail. I remember how important it was to hear from our family and friends from afar. John Schmidt would drop off the mail at the train station every morning and return to pick up the deliveries in the afternoon. Seemed like the whole town would gather to see what would be in that mail sack. By the way, John and Lil are the grandparents of someone you might know, Marilyn Marks. Another of my pastimes was playing cards with my girlfriends, Esther Stead, Ruth Jones, and Pat Haas's mother, Alita Reed. Francis and Louis Sasso ran the popular local watering hole. They served meals to their guests and I taught Francis how to bake the delicious pies that I served at the boarding house. One of their specialties was oyster stew that was served the day before Thanksgiving. And after the Christmas service at St. Teresa's, all the churchgoers filed down the hill for free Tom and Jerry's. <laughs> Every other Sunday, the Catholics had to purchase their own drinks. <laughs> My son, Ed, was a frequent visitor to Sasso's and he occasionally took little Sally along with him. Louie had a little mug that he kept behind the bar just for her. I hate to think what he poured into that glass. After Louie died, his son Mike helped Francis manage the business. When they came upon hard times, we helped them out financially because that's just what good neighbors do. Sometimes the stress of running the boarding house Feeding prisoners and tramps and caring for my family and neighbors was just too much. Then I'd send little Sally to the drugstore to pick up a bottle of Lydia Pinkham, available as a liquid elixir or as pills. I see I've about run out of time, so I'd like to leave you with a bit of wisdom I've learned over the years. My granddaughter Sally claims that she heard me repeat these gems many times over the years. And I hope that they inspire you as well. If you keep the light in the room dim enough, the guests won't see the dust. <laughs> God gave everyone a brain. Some just didn't get as much as others. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Eliza Chapman Meredith. I was born in the town of Troy on October 17, 1893, to Wallace and Anna Chapman. I had eight siblings, and my mother trusted me to help with the instruction of the younger kids. We were fortunate with good parents. There was lots of love and kindness in that house, and someone always wanted to help another understand. As a young woman, I attended Whitewater Normal School to complete the requirements to receive a teaching diploma. Can you believe it only took six weeks to study? I began my career in 1912 teaching in a one-room school near Troy Center in the Randall School District. To my chagrin, the school closed just two years later, but I was fortunate to find work at my alma mater, Baker School. Unfortunately, this school also closed after two years. At the time, there were only three students enrolled, so it was understandable that it had to shutter the doors. The next five years saw me teaching at Adams and Stewart schools. 
People often ask me how I managed to teach children in all grades, eight grades in one room. Well, the older students would help me by teaching and taking care of the younger ones. I was fortunate to have my sister help me correct papers in the evening. A teacher's work is never done. In 1921, I was bitten by the love bug and I tied the knot with my husband, Irving Meredith. In those days, married women devoted themselves to their husbands and families, and I walked away from my teaching career. I became a farmer's wife at the Meredith Homestead, located on Highway 67, about a mile south of Eagle. Tragedy struck in, you guessed it, two years when my beloved husband, Irving, passed away. My father urged me to come home, reasoning that I would not be able to maintain the 80-acre farm on my own. I moved in with my parents, but I went right back to my former career, finding work at the school at Baker's Corners. After six years there, I transferred to Jericho School in 1929. I enjoyed 15 years of teaching the farm children who lived in that community. I stayed with the Walter Schaefer family instead of commuting back and forth because the roads were so bad. Folks often asked me how I was able to manage the behavior of students in my class. I found that discipline was rarely an issue. I would just take the troubled student aside and offer a quiet word of encouragement. It worked like a charm. In 1944, I was hired to teach a class of 48 students at a one-room school in Eagleville. Quite a different experience from the handful of students at Baker School from 30 years ago. After the war, it seemed many people were moving out to the country and to the lakes. Eagle Spring Lake area was growing which increased the Eagleville school attendance. In 1941, there were 231 teachers in Waukesha County. By 1958, the figure was 902. The number of students went from 6,500 to over 20,000 in the same years. No wonder I was having trouble with all those names. <laughs> But I do remember the name of Frances Anich. She was a special in her drawing ability. Her poster got first place at the Waukesha Dairy Fair. She took honors for Eagleville. The dairy show was held along the Fox River in Waukesha every year. Our students always looked forward to participating, some showing their animals, others like Frances making posters. In 1956, I retired from teaching to take care of my aging mother. Our family farm had been sold to the Girl Scouts and became Camp Chapman Hill. I hear that the camp has recently closed, but the Nature Conservancy now protects in my family's homestead as a lovely wetland of Maguanago. I trust that they will be good stewards of the land for future generations. In 1957, I had a new house built on Park Avenue, an eagle by Arthur Judas, who sold his farm and subdivided some of the land. I continued to teach as a substitute. One of my regular jobs was for Dorothy Mason of Palmyra. I could always count on her to go deer hunting every November. <laughs> After I retired, I enjoyed visits from former students their children, and their grandchildren. I know, or I know I taught in the best of times. Those less crowded days gave me names I remember, and they will remember me too. I was an active member of the Eagle United Methodist Church, and in 1982, I was honored to receive the Outstanding Citizen Award by the Eagle Lioness. For almost a century, I lived a life of service for my family and my community. I am proud to have called Eagle my home.
there have been many varied women's clubs in Eagle, some of which were the Priscilla's Club, the Night Owls, Royal Neighbors, Homemakers, St. Teresa's Altar Society, the United Methodist Women, the American Legion Auxiliary, Eagles Lioness, and the Girl Scouts. I would like to recognize, and so would the Eagle Historical Society, some very special guests. If you have ever belonged to a women's organization in Eagle, would you please stand? If not, you can raise your hand too, that's acceptable. <laughs> Would you ladies mind telling us what organizations you had belonged to? Speak up. You raised your hands. You were up. You said you were organizations. Okay, Bev, what ones were you in? I belonged to the Homemakers Award Junior Group. There's and I was also involved with the Girl Scouts for quite a few years. Very good. I have a 25 year pin for the Girl Scouts. Wow. <laughs> and you? so everyone can hear, use the microphone. Can't you hear me? <laughs> Jean Bowie wished that she could be here, but she's in Linden Grove, and she grew up here. She's going to be 93 this summer, but she said, Mrs. Stewart and Mrs. Beckett and several other ladies from Eagle were in the Owls, which was a card club. And Mrs. Stewart would take her, everybody walked except Mrs. Stewart. She would take her car, pick up Mrs. Beckett, but she didn't know how to back up. <laughs> so she would go around the blocks and then take Mrs. Beckett to, the to wherever they were going to be going. And they always did their chores in the morning, had their big dinner, and then put on their good dresses, and that was waiting for visitors. One of the organizations in Eagle was the Priscilla Club. I didn't know anything about the Priscilla Club, so I had to go online and see what I could find. It was named for Priscilla Millens Alden, a member of the Plymouth Colony and a character in the 1858 poem, The Courtship of Miles Standish by Longfellow. In the poem, Priscilla tells John Alden, who is courting her on behalf of Miles Standish, to speak for yourself, John. The Priscilla's Club was formed for domestic workers whose traditional days off was only Thursday. And it was formed for friendship, learning new skills, and self-advancement. It evolved into philanthropic ventures, campaigning for the right to vote, supporting women workers in industry during World War II, and even the recruiting and training of dogs for the armed forces. Although it is no longer an active club in Eagle, there are some clubs that are over 100 years old. In conclusion, let's welcome back our women of Eagle to share a poem from the Priscilla Club. Alice Baker, who is portrayed by Ellie Hawes. <laughs> Mrs. Wood, portrayed by Elaine Ledrowski. <laughs> Mary Churchill Cloyer, portrayed by Mary Anderson. 
Catherine Wedham, portrayed by Gina Neist. And Liza Chapman Meredith, portrayed by her great niece, Jenny Chapman Arnold. Here's the old Priscilla Club, who has carried many a year to blossom forth with all their mirth and toast to the days of yore. They gathered from the east, they gathered from the west, they chatted so merry and gay. The time for parting came all too soon to be remembered another day. Before we part, we bow our heads to offer a silent prayer for those who left us and those who are gone to meet on the other shore. Come again, dear old pals. Let's not wait till too late to gather once more as of yore to talk of the days, the good old times of years ago. Isabel. By Isabel, in memory of our meeting, August 29th, 1937. Much. I would also like to acknowledge Sally McKenzie. Sally, can you wave way in the back? <laughs> Sally is that granddaughter that I was talking about for her, her grandma, Catherine Wedham, <coughs> and she's here with some of her family members, and we'd like to welcome all the Wedham family here. Thank you for coming. And now, let's share memories over treats provided by the Baker Library.